of traditional talk people pontificating about this or that the left or the right sometimes the truth is just all lost in the noise having learned life lessons the hard way chuck gallagher international speaker and author cuts through the noise to share truth through transparency nationally known guests talk about what's important to you your life your concerns and your success so tune in turn on to straight talk with chuck gallagher now here's your host chuck gallagher Hi, this is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio on Transformation Talk Radio, and I am so excited today. You know, with Straight Talk Radio, one of the things that we try to do is make sure that we bring you something that you can practically use, that you can listen to as you're uh, driving in your car or listening to on the podcast that follows, and sit back and say, you know, that was something that really worked for me. I mean, this is Transformation Talk Radio. So let's think about things that can be transformative. Now, I think most of you that listen to the show, uh, at least on a fairly regular basis, know that I have a, um, how should we put it, rather sordid past. Uh, It's now, uh, at least in my age, I'm now 57 years old, um, but when I was back in my 20s, I was a CPA tax partner in a firm. I had testified before Congress. I had written articles in national tax magazines. I taught continuing professional education courses in 30 states. Man, I thought I had this thing whipped. But I was also stupid. I can actually think of other words to use, but I'm not going to use them for this is radio. Uh, the best way to put it is I was overextended and underfunded, or maybe another way to put it is I had way too much debt. And instead of using my God-given common sense to solve that simple problem, I made a wrong set of choices and ultimately created what is now referred to as a Ponzi scheme, although I have to admit at the time I didn't know what a Ponzi scheme was. And I've said many times, every choice we make in life has a consequence. Now, the problem with doing something wrong or making a unethical set of choices, or some choices that fall out of integrity, is if you understand that every choice has a consequence, there will always be one, even if you think there won't. And my consequence came in 1990 when the House of Cards collapsed. And even though I, with the help of family and friends, was able to make restitution to the people that I had so painfully stolen money from, the fact is it didn't change what I did, and there is a consequence that follows. And for me, that was federal prison. Now, I will say that was a painful part of life. And now some, well, 30 years later, pretty doggone close to it, I find myself in a completely different situation here on Transformation Talk Radio with Straight Talk. And today, the cool part about this is, is my guest is probably the nation's premier speaker, author on issues of um, why good people make bad choices. Gary Zining is a CPA. He owns a company called The Pros and the Cons, which, by the way, I love it's a classic title. I happen to be one of the cons on uh, Gary's speaker list. And through his organization, we're able to talk to people all around the country about how good people make bad choices and what takes place. And I'm so excited to have Gary on the show because we're going to talk a lot about what happens and what he's able to see because he brings a depth of experience that you won't want to miss here on this show. So, Gary, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chuck. And, um, gee, I'm sure that none of the listeners today have ever done anything stupid. Well, so that kind of gets us off on the right foot. <laughs> well, you know, the funny part is, Gary, and, I, and you've seen this, I know, but I have been in audiences before when you come out and you start talking and you, you know, just openly admit, okay, I screwed up and, and here's what took place. And some people have their arms folded like, I would never do anything wrong. And it's like, really? I mean, come on. Everybody has the potential. Now, that doesn't mean everybody will commit a financial fraud, as you know, but everybody has the potential to do something wrong, 
and to assume that that's not going to take place or that unethical behavior only falls in the realm of financial issues is a big mistake. Yeah, one of the things I always do to kind of set the stage, because you're right, so many people sit there and they cross, they cross their arms and say, oh, I'm not that stupid. I say, okay, let me ask you a simple question. Uh, how many of you are, ethi are ethical people or ethical doctors or ethical CPAs or, you know, whatever, whatever audience we're talking to, of course, everybody holds their hand up. I mean, what else are they going to say, right? And right. so they say, okay, let me ask you another question. Since you're all ethical, how many of you think it's unethical to break the law? And so about, you know, typically about 75 or 80% will raise your hand. Okay. And so, okay, so let me ask you another question. If it's unethical to break the law, but you're an ethical person, then why do you speed when you drive your car? It's illegal. Why do you do it? So what I always try and do is to, it's kind of like doing a, a, a drug case where you start with a low-level guy and you work your way up. And so you ease them into it, and before you know it, You've got an admitting well under that set of circumstances. Of course, I'd steal a million dollars. And so there's always a set of circumstances where somebody says, well, that doing that is more important than my ethics and than me going to prison. And people say, oh, no, it's not. I'd never go, go to go to prison. Oh, really? Well, let me ask you a question. Is it, is it illegal to go five miles over the speed limit? Uh-huh. Is it illegal to go 50 miles over the speed of it? Uh-huh. So why do you do five but not 50? They're both illegal. So why do you do one illegal act but not the other? And which almost everybody does. I mean, I, how do I know about all this stuff? Because I've done. I mean, fastest I've ever had my motorcycle was 100 spots. That was like really <laughs> stupid and like way too dangerous. So I stopped doing that and started skydiving. So, oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's real thrilled. The jump master on my first jump was 14 years old and had 700 jumps. Yeah. Yeah. No. 700, oh, yeah, 700, 700 jumps. And, and for a number of years now, you've had to go tandem three times before they'll let you go solo. Back in the year when I started, this has got to be, oh, at least 20 or 25 years ago, you went solo the first time. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you put your feet out, you get out, you, you hand, hand wiggle out under the high wing plane, and you look over at the jump master, it gives you a thumbs up, and you just let go, and you fall away from the plane. And the most important thing you got to do, is, and you have to go through six, seven hours of training, the most important thing you have to do, you have to remember that when you let go of the plane, your body is like this, because if your body's like this, you'll flip upside down, and then the parachute's on the bottom. It doesn't deploy very well. Oh, no, no, that would not yeah, work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that was the one time I thought I was lucky I didn't do anything that well. Just landed in the cornfield. So, the difference is that almost everybody will drive five or 10 miles over the speed limit, but we won't do 50, even though they're both illegal. And the reason is that driving five or 10 over the speed limit is socially acceptable. People will do things even if they're illegal, if they're socially acceptable. So when people think that the rules aren't fair, they'll violate. It's the same reason that prohibition didn't work. So have you ever heard, it's my company and I can do whatever I want? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, it's not true. Don't ever do it. And what people, what business people do are executive directors of nonprofits or you know, the, the county commissioner. I'm just going to say the boss for generics. Make it easy. What they do is they say, it's my company. I can do whatever I want. Well, that's a form of bullying. And whether they're trying to bully the controller or the CFO or the bookkeeper or the auditor or the tax guy or the lawyer, whoever it is, is trying to draw a line in the sand and say, I don't think so. They're saying, it's my company. I can do whatever I want. It's a form of bullying. Well, here's the problem. It's not true. The first part may be true. It's my company. Let's assume that's true. They own 100% of the stock or they're the sure. executive director. But I can do whatever I want. It's flat not true. Because... We do not live in a free market society. If we live in a true free market society, you can do whatever you want and you can. So we have thousands and thousands, and in fact, the tens of thousands of all. So you have to keep, if you're a trucking company, the drivers can only drive so many hours in a 24-hour period, and they have to have so many hours of rest. You have to have the brakes fixed on the car, on the truck. You have to, the tire tech has so much tread on it. There are thousands of laws that we all, you have to pay minimum wage. There are thousands of laws that we all have to obey. So you literally can't do whatever you want. 
So the statement, when it's combined, I can do whatever I want, it's my company, I can do whatever I want, is flat not true. So moral of the story is, if you're a controller, you're a CFO or an auditor or a tax guy or, or you know, just the warehouse, the warehouse manager, whatever it is, it's not true. Don't ever let anybody push you around that. You know, Gary, you, you said something a minute ago that um, really connected an interesting dot for me. And that is, you made the comment, and I think I want to say this correctly, if, it, if it's inaccurate, correct me, but if it's socially acceptable, then it's, in the minds of people, it's okay to break the law. Correct. That's why prohibition didn't work, because we passed a law in Lowtown called, prohibition actually started about 10 miles from my house, in no, Lowtown called West, Westerville, Ohio. And Westerville was dry until, because that was kind of the little town's claim to fame, until mm, they voted on maybe three or four years ago. They finally got you know, beer, and alcohol, beer and wine sales in the town. Um, and so that's why we all drive five or ten miles over the speed limit. You know, if, and if you're driving the speed limit and the left lung people will honk at you, get the hell out of the way, right? So breaking the law is socially acceptable, and that's why people do it. But going 50 isn't. So here's kind of the analogy that, that I and I use a lot of analogies when I speak because analogies are really powerful to explain things. Because if you can use an analogy with somebody that they already know and accept something and link the new thing to it, they're much more likely to understand it and remember. So the analogy is we all go five or ten miles over the speed limit, but most of the time we won't go 30 or 40 or 50 over. Because one, it's socially unacceptable, and, and somebody's going to call and report you, you're going to get a hell of a traffic fine because the cops are going to come after you, right? And so think, it, think of a situation where even though it's socially unacceptable, you would drive 30 or 40 miles over the speed limit. So you would do something that you normally wouldn't do. So your, your three-year-old kid could be you could like I lose track of them and they wander out in the street and get get hurt. So so the, the, you call 911. I'm sorry, we can't come for two hours because there's a big truck wreck on the freeway. You'll put your three year old in the car and you'll go 30 or 40 miles over the speed limit to get to the hospital. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Let, let's do this. I hear the music in the background that says it's uh, it's time for a break. I want to come back to that example because I think that example is very powerful. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. My guest is Gary Ziney, and he is the owner of The Pros and the Cons, and is absolutely a master of understanding uh, human behavior and why we do some of the things that we do. So stick with us, and let's reconnect after the break with 30 miles over the speed limit to save my child. Stick with us. (laughs) This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. We're back after the break. Thanks for sticking with us. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's always fascinating to talk about why people make the choices that they make. And today's, well, today's show is a really fun one for me because one of my good friends, Gary Ziney, is the owner of a speaker's bureau entitled The Pros and the Cons. Gary is a pro. I'm a con. Um, I'm not sure that that's the best of things in the world to be categorized, but we've been talking about human behavior, why people do some of the things that they do, especially when it comes to unethical behavior and perhaps illegal behavior. But before we went to the break, Gary was talking about social behavior and and, and why people do some of the things they do. And, And gosh, what would happen if your child was hurt and you needed to rush them to the hospital or to for medical care, would you go 30 or 40 miles over the speed limit? And I said, absolutely. Gary, let's pick back up with that. Yeah, and what happens is that most of us think that ethics is a bright line or it's black and white. And, and ethics, for the most part, depends on the situation that people find themselves in. So um, the, your, your child gets hurt. 911 EMS can't get there for a couple of hours. Your child is seriously hurt. Of course, you'll go 30 or 40 miles over the speed limit, and it's called situational. And you'll go more than you over the speed limit. You'll break the speed limit and break the law more than you normally do. Why? Because 
it's more important for you to get your child to the doctor to see you know, save their life than to be an ethical person who only go five miles over the speed limit. So what we all do, including me, is we adjust our ethics depending on what the situation is. So let me give, let me give you an example. Is let's say that you know, all of your listeners now are a took a new job on Monday and they're the chief financial officer of a some high tech company that just got a ten million dollar venture capital infusion. And it's a high tech company and you don't need health insurance because of course the average age of the workers in high tech companies is like twelve years old. They're only they're the only ones that what's going on. So you don't need health insurance. So you're there three or four months and one day you go to work and your phone rings. Oh, Jerry, honey, uh, honey, this is Sue um, and Alice. That's your five-year-old daughter. You know, ha Alice hadn't been feeling well. Yeah. Well, Alice uh, started coughing up blood after you went to work. We're at the hospital and she's run some tests, and they've got uh, she has uh, cancer. And if we don't start fifty thousand dollars a week treatment, she's going to be dead in six months. Well, here's the problem: you don't have health insurance. You make right. too much to get on Medicare, Medicare, and you're getting kind of assistance. You don't have time to do bake sales. Your parents don't have money. You don't have equity in your house. Most people don't have an extra 50 grand away plan. But you're, right. the chief, you're the chief financial officer. One of the reasons you just joined this company was because they just got a $10 million venture capital infusion. And you're, that's going, that money's going to last you for, let's say, four or five years. So you got a pile of stock options to go to work for this company. And so <clears throat> you don't have health insurance. So here's the situation. This is the, this is the, the money, money analogy to your child getting hit, hit in, the, in the road. And you're on your way, you're going 30 miles an hour over the speed line, get the hospital. So you need, need $50,000 a week. And let's say it's gonna cost just a million dollars to do these treatments, and you don't have the money, and no insurance. And the hospital is gonna take any, and you're gonna do it without without being paid. So, but you've got access to 50, you got access to $10 million. So, how, one of the questions I, I set this situation up in class and then asked, how many of you are going to steal $50,000 a week, a million dollars in total? And usually if there's, you know, 50 or 60 or 100 people in class, and eh, typically about 10% will, will raise their hand. Okay. So then, okay, now the other 90% don't put your hand up. So here's the question. So, if you don't steal the money and can't pay for the treatments, that's the only way to get the treatments. How many of you are willing to let your daughter die? Right. And usually nobody holds their hand up. Absolutely. And so, so, so here's the question. You can't have it both ways. You can't say, I won't steal the money and yet have the money to pay your daughter's life. So either steal the money and pay for the treatments and hope to save life, or you deliberately make a decision to let your daughter die. Pick one. Somebody, and at this point, people's brains will start to process, oh, my God, what am I going to do? So they'll start to come up with all kinds of things. Well, <clears throat> I'll borrow money. Now, remember, I said you can't borrow the money. Well, I'll sell my house. Now you have time to sell the house. So you're down to your last choice, which is steal the money. Now, most of you are going to say, I'm not, going to, I'm not stealing the money. I'm just borrowing the money. Right. It's called rationalization and fraud. So all rationalization is, is you're changing your behavior because you're in a situation that you don't know any other way to solve the problem. And so you'll rationalize doing something that you normally wouldn't do, like steal a million dollars, $50,000 at a time. So if you're saying, I'll pay, I'm, I'm not stealing the money. I'm just borrowing the money. That means you have to be telling yourself you'll pay it back. So what's a, what's a way that you can tell yourself that you're paying the money back and so you're not stealing them? Well, when, I, when the company goes public, stock remember, options. I said you stock options. I'll sell my right. stock. I'll put the money back so I'm not stealing it. I'm just borrowing. And that's the kind of mental gymnastics that people go through. So normally you wouldn't drive 40 miles below the speed limit, but your daughter just got hit by a car. Same thing, the uh, same rationalization is different situation than normal. Uh, the only difference is one involves your daughter got hit by a car. The other is your daughter has cancer. So one's driving, going 40 some miles over the speed limit. The other is you're taking the money. But in both situations, you're rationalizing breaking the law. 
Now, Gary, you and I both easily can talk probably for hours on what years ago was dubbed the fraud triangle. Yeah. Need, opportunity, rationalization. And and I know we're going to be running up on a break here in a minute, but but I really want us to kind of play with that now and, and perhaps after after our break. Because it strikes me, and maybe I'm missing something, that really every choice that we make kind of still falls into those three things. And, and let me it give does. you the example. Where am I going to eat for lunch today? Or what am I going to eat? Well, I'm on a diet. So I have a need. I need to eat. Now, that's simple. It's not a hard need. It's not hard to define. But there's a need. What happens to be within reasonable driving distance of my office that I can grab for lunch? There's my opportunity. Now, the question comes down to, do I stick to my diet and ditch the carbs, uh, or do I rationalize that, well, you know, having a hamburger, which is on the diet, but with the bun, I mean, the bun is not really that big a deal, and who's going to know anyway? still comes back to that same triangle. So it, it strikes me that that maybe as human beings, everything is really based upon what is our need, what's the opportunity, and how do I rationalize it? It just goes to different levels at some point when it gets a bit absurd, like the child with medical care or the one that was hit. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Virtually every decision we make has those three components. And it was first described by Dr. Donald Cressy uh, back in the 1930s and then, um, I'm sorry, in the 1940s, and then he went to a prison in the early 50s, interviewed 200 embezzlers, found out every one of them had those three things. So they need to solve a problem, so it's either money or lunch, opportunity, like driving your car, there aren't many cops around, so I can speed, and if I have a hamburger with the bun, nobody's going to notice that, and so in that situation. And then the rationalization is, it's called, it's called moral balancing. Well, if I eat carrots all day, I can have a scoop of ice cream at night. Right. And so most people have a relatively fixed amount of moral behavior. So when you're more moral than you normally are in one area, you'll let it go in another area. So, for example, if we have any CPAs or audits on the line, very often you'll find, okay, the, 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 the owner of this $20 million company, I stopped them from recording a half million dollar sale in the wrong year to get the bank loan renewed, but okay, they can, take, they can use $5,000 of the company money for a personal vacation. So I, I morally was okay when the, big, when the big stuff was on the table, so I'm going to let this little thing over here go. So in your example of lunch, okay, I'm going to stick to my diet with the big stuff, but I'll have, I'll have the top of the bun, not the whole bun. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. I do understand. And, By the yeah. way, I did not have a bun today. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and we, all tend to do, we all tend to do those things. I, do, I mean, I teach this stuff, and I still do it, but at least I know I'm doing it, and so I, I, call, my, I call myself on it. So I have ice cream right. and don't feel guilty about it, because I eat well, well, well the rest of the day. So that's why business people do. They say, the, the rationalization is, remember we said, $20 million company, half million dollar sale in the wrong year. So let's say that sale is supposed to be on January the 3rd. They go ahead and record it on December 27th. Why? Because they need the extra revenue and profits to get the bank loan automatically renewed. Right. The forklift driver in the warehouse where this sale is taking place says, well, I should have gotten a bonus. I didn't get a bonus. And the owner still went on that $5,000 vacation and ran it through the company. Now, how would the forklift driver know that? And so the forklift driver's good friends with the bookkeeper who wrote the check to reimburse the owner's $5,000 trip that was clearly personal. Um, I always hate it when the break comes up, but you know, let's, we, we, we gotta go back to the example to finish out the bookkeeper and the owner and the forklift driver. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. And you know, it's been fascinating thus far to talk with Gary Zane, the owner of the pros and the cons. And if you have any interest in really understanding how this works, visit Gary's website. We'll be back in just a moment with Transformation Talk Radio, Straight Talk with Chuck Gallagher.
Hi, this is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio, and we're back after the break. We are talking with Gary Ziney. Gary is literally, as far as I'm concerned, the nation's foremost expert when it comes especially to talking with folks in the accounting industry about issues of uh, fraud and, and, and ethical behavior and what really happens, the, the, the real meat behind it. And we, we were talking before the break about the, the reality that all choices we make fall into three categories or three things come together to, to create the choice, need, opportunity, and rationalization. And Gary, I hated that we had to break as we did, but you were talking about that, that business owner who um, advanced a sale in, we'll call it this year, that really was next year's sale, but it advanced it this year to get the bank loan and, and, and took out some money from the account, a small amount, $5,000 that was uh, clearly a personal expense um, and expected to be reimbursed for it. Let's talk a little bit about sometimes how these things get exposed because you were going down that road and that's really so practical. Yeah, and, and this is really, really common, especially with small companies, nonprofits, government entities is that people will use the company, and I'm just going to say company generic, like for any kind of entity. They'll right. use the company as their own personal piggy bank and they'll rationalize, well, it's my company, I can do whatever I want. And we talked about earlier how that just flat isn't true. And so what happens is that the owner says, well, it's a $20 million company. I only spent $5,000 on this trip to bail for the family. Well, the forklift drivers, we started to talk about before the break, said, well, <clears throat> that could have been that $5,000. I haven't I gotten a pay raise for three years. That $5,000, that could have been my pay raise. And so the forklift driver will start to steal a little bit of inventory, sell it on Craigslist or flea markets or eBay or whatever, and that's rationalization. If the owner, and, and the forklift driver knows it, it's wrong, but the rationalization is just overwhelming. I'm just getting what's due to me. And what the right. business owner doesn't understand, the, the, the boss doesn't understand, is that people behave the way they see those above them behaving. So when the lower level people see the upper level people using the company for their, as their own personal piggy bank, the lower level people say, well, it must be okay. In other words, sure. Sure. The yeah. lower level people mimic the behavior of the more powerful people. That's why children go up to be like their parents. Right. And so what happens is that the cheating and fraud, even at small levels, literally becomes part of the, of the corporate culture. And all you have to do, and it's, and it's irrelevant what the size of the organization is, look at what just happened to General Motors with the ignition, and they didn't report the ignition switches for 10 years. And many, many people, according to the press, knew the ignition switches were defective. So what they said was, well, it's a cost, it was a customer complaint issue, even though when the, the, the key turned off, it turned off the airbag and the power steering, people couldn't drive their car, and uh, allegedly, um, at least GM at this point has been reported as acknowledging that 13 people were killed because of it. The malpractice lawyers, of course, say it's probably you know, 50, 60, 70, some bigger number. Sure. So, so here's, the, here's the point about materiality. There are millions and millions and millions of, of General Motors cars out there, and only 13 of them allegedly, at least according to GM, have been killed because of the it's ignition switch. Well, well, thir so 13 out of millions and millions of cars is, is immaterial, quote unquote. So, right. so if, if 13 out of millions and millions is immaterial, why is GM getting sued? Because of their cultural behavior. Right, and so big business owners and executive directors and nonprofits and government people—they literally don't understand how their behavior forms the basis for the way many people, not not all certainly, but the way many people uh, will behave inside the organization. So when lower level people see it going on at the upper levels, the lower level people many times will start to do it too. Then it becomes part of the culture, and it's almost impossible to stop. Once you let it get started, it's almost impossible to stop. Yeah, and Gary, I, I have to say, um, like you, I have the opportunity to, to, to speak to a number of companies or, or around the country, and it's certainly not limited to just CPAs. And it's fascinating, and, and I, I don't mind saying this on a public basis, I get hired for one of two reasons. 
either A, the company truly, truly has a culture of ethical behavior, and you can tell that whenever you're doing the interview with the folks at HR and accounting and so forth before the presentation, or they know that uh, my presentation on ethics is a legal defense under the United States sentencing guidelines, so that if someone does something wrong or illegal, they can say, well, but we taught them to do different, even though you can tell at the upper levels that I'm just a surface uh, defense, for lack of a better way of putting it. Yeah, they're trying to put their ducks in a row for uh, plausible deniability. Well, we gave them all the training. You know, we, exactly. we, uh, we, we're, we're not responsible. So let me give you an example of how that doesn't work. Remember, it's probably been 10 plus years ago, Domino's had 30 minutes or it's free? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, right. So the strategy was when, do, when people order a pizza, when do they want it? Right now. There's right. nothing wrong with it. You want your pizza right now. And so one of the ways you make more money is to guarantee what you're doing. So 30 minutes or it's free. The problem was that the way the system worked in many of the stores, from what I've been able to find out, is that if the driver got to the pizza there within 30 minutes, they would typically get 25 or 50 cents. But if they were late with the pizza, the company would take three bucks out of their pay. That was to pay for the ingredients. Because if you don't have a punishment, then the drivers will have their friends order deliberately be late, and so they'd have to give the pizza away free. So it's a control mechanism. Okay. Well, the problem is what business people don't understand, and I mean everybody that's in charge of people, what we very often don't understand is that any time you change a system, people will always change their behavior. Behavior never stays sound. And so then building on top of that, people behave the way you pay them to behave. So right. Domino's reportedly um, had thousands and thousands and thousands of reports in their file about drivers you know, getting into little fender benders and getting speeding tickets and going through four-way stops, et cetera, et cetera. And so they had the system for, I don't know, four or five years. And it blew up one evening when a young driver, I hear 20 years old, uh, went through a four-way stop and I think it was in East St. Louis, Illinois, and I ran over a woman in a crosswalk and killed her. And, yeah. And so Domino's thought they had two really good defenses, and they went to trial. One defense was, <clears throat> we tell them all the time, obey the law. Right. And, there, and the second defense was, the drivers are independent contractors. They're not employees. So right. Domino's went to trial, lost the lawsuit. And I think the jury awarded something like $2.7 million in okay. that case. And so <clears throat> Domino's didn't stop and think, when we pay them a little bit to deliver on time, we have this big punishment if they deliver late and have to give the pizza away free, the drivers are going to change their behavior. So right. when they put that system in, it wasn't a matter of if one of the drivers was going to run over somebody and kill them. It was a matter of, of when. When. And what people do, what business people do, what bosses do, is they change the rule and don't realize that people are going to change their behavior. Why do you think, well, after Congress changed law and now children have to go in the back, uh, young children in car seats have to go in the back? Statistically, it's much safer in a wreck for kids to be in the back than in the front because a few kids right. who are killed bareback. Well, there are now many more children that die being left in hot cars than were ever killed by airbags because the parents get distracted and forget their back there. Right. So you change a rule or set up a new system, what you have to do is to think forward, how will people change their behavior under the new system? And then that's what you design for. Now, Gary, I, I, I want to I, I wanna veer a little bit in a, in a slightly different direction. I. I get what you're saying there, but I, I happened to be out in uh, L.A. Um, doing a presentation, and, and I was talking about the triangle, you know, need, opportunity, and rationalization. Because one of the things that you and I both know is from time to time, there are some people whose, uh, what I want to call it, morality button is, is very high on certain things. And it's right. like, I would never, ever right. steal 
So I was sitting there, and, I, and I, I, it was an off-the-cuff example. By the way, it's not true, but I've been married for almost 16 years. So I said, you know, I've been married for almost 16 years, so let's play this potential example out. Gosh, I, um, well, the spark isn't the same as it was 16 years ago. And again, I'm 16 years older, but that's a different issue. But, you know, the spark isn't quite the same. And, you know, I live on the East Coast, but I'm here in Los Angeles, and it's it's March Madness, and I'm sitting at the bar watching Duke lose. <laughs> so painful. Um, <laughs> this really nice young lady comes sits beside me, a little younger than I am, and, and, and she gets to talking about basketball. We have a really pleasant conversation. It's a noisy bar, and, of course, every time you check into the hotel, they ask you how many keys you want. And for the life of me, I haven't figured that one out, but apparently it's to share. So she sets a key down and she says, you know, it's going to be much quieter in the room. Would you like to watch the game there? Oh, well, let me think. Need. Gosh, it, it, it'd be nice if there was something a little more zippy sexually <laughs> taking place. And, well, the opportunity is here. I'm in Los Angeles and she just laid her key down. And after all, Who's going to know? Right. Uh, It kind of comes down to what you don't know won't hurt you. And with that said, we'll get back to that right after the break, because what you don't know will will hurt you, as Gary Ziney says, owner of the pros and the cons. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. We'll be back in a moment. Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. We're back, and this is the last segment we have with Gary Ziney, owner of The Pros and the Cons. Gary is a nationwide speaker. He uh, talks with audiences all over the country and outside of the country on behavior, why we do what we do. And one of the things that I led up to as we were finishing that third segment going into the fourth, which, by the way, none of which was true, was going to that rationalization or that concept that, well, what you don't know won't hurt you. And Gary, you say what you don't know will hurt you. Let's talk about that. Yeah, very few things stay private. So the question is, even if it does stay private, are you willing to take that risk? Is one night worth that kind of risk? And right. that, that's the rationalization. So. Let me get me, and many people would say, well, you know, I'm true blue, I would never cheat on my spouse, and for most people, that's true, although the, the last numbers I saw about uh, third, is all, within just a couple percentage points, as many women now admit to having affairs as men, it was just on some show on TV a couple of days ago. So let me give you one that's even more um, forceful, because what I like to do is to put people in a situation where even... The, even though they've been a lifelong, honest, ethical person, oh, yeah, I, I, I would have to think about doing that. So if you remember in the first segment, I said, let's pretend your daughter is, is, is sick, and you need, to do 50, you need to pay for $50,000 a week treatment. So uh-huh. let's, let's, say it's going, let's say it's going to pay $50,000 a week. How many are going to steal the money? So usually about, uh, as I said, about a third will hold their hands up. And, okay, so here's the choice. Steal the $50,000 a week or let, knowingly let your daughter die. So here's, right. the ethics, here's the ethics question. Remember I said ethics is rarely absolute. There are a few things in life that are absolute. And so ethics is situational. So let me ask you a question. How many of you are willing to do five years in prison for stealing a million dollars to save your daughter's life? Almost everybody will hold up their hand. So here's the question. Why are you willing to go to prison, but you won't allow yourself to say, I steal the money? Oh, that's a powerful question. So you'll, you'll see, most crooks will do the crime, but they don't want to do the time. Most business people, most honest people are willing to do the time, but not the crime. We're backwards. <laughs> okay. That's a, that's a fascinating thing to hear. <laughs> and, and so how is it ethical? to knowingly let your daughter die. And when you've got the ability to potentially save her life, and even if you can't put the money back, because you remember you're just borrowing it, you'll put it back. And so even if you can't put the money back, it's going to cost you five, eight, you're going to have to you five years in prison. So how is it ethical to let your daughter die when you can potentially save her life? So uh, a couple of years ago, I was teaching someplace, and I said, how many of you let your, you let your daughter die? And for the first and only time ever, this lady pulls her hand up. So I, I thought she was joking. 
So I looked at her and said, no, you wouldn't. She says, yes, I wouldn't. I said, no, you wouldn't. She says, yes, I wouldn't. I said, oh, really? What do you do for a living? She says, I'm a professor at such and such university here in town. I said, really? How many kids do you have? None. Right. I said, here, and, and you know, all, everybody else in the class, like, 50, 50, 49 other people in class just cracked up. So here's the point. If you don't have children, you're not qualified to answer the question. Right. Right. right? And right. because everybody, I mean, think about this. If your child is out in the street, and here's a big truck coming down the street who clearly does not see your three-year-old, how many of you would run out, push your child out of the street, and you know you're going to get run over and maybe killed? Everybody will do that, right? So here's an ethical question. So you'll give your life to save your child, but you won't let yourself, you won't tell yourself, you uh, allow yourself to steal a million dollars. Yes, you are. Sure. So the reason I make it so extreme is because most people won't, connect with the person at the bar, but the right. stakes are high enough. It's the need, right. the need, right. the opportunity, and, and the rationalization. So the need is I need to pay for the treatments. The opportunity is there's really poor internal control. My boss trusts me, and the rationalization is I'll pay the money back. So a really powerful fraud to prevention and deterrent is, <clears throat> is ask people what will happen to their family if they do something wrong and they go to prison? Because most people will put themselves at risk, but they won't deliberately put their family at risk. And of course, they're right. going to get caught. So they'll take the risk for themselves, but they won't take the risk for their family, especially if they're the primary grade one. Right. So, so say, what will happen to your family if you go to jail? So I'll give you a real example. We had a guy here in Columbus, my little hometown here in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, who was the chief financial officer of a nonprofit. One day, long story short, he picked up the phone and wired transferred the entire checking account balance of $7.2 million to himself in Austria. Okay. He left his wife a message, what he'd done. She gets home and hears it and calls the FBI and turns her husband. Well, okay. he, go, he goes to the big house, the Great Bar Motel, for, I think it was 15, 12, 12, 15 years. She got fired from her job because of what her husband did. They had to move to a town about 30 miles away because the two kids were getting beat up in school because of what the dad did. Wow. And, of course, he's in prison, can't do anything about it. Right. So think about what will happen to your family. How will they live? Will your spouse get fired? And, right. the odds are, and, and most states are employment at will. And if the employer says, well, you know, if the husband or if, if one of them's doing it, what, is, what are the odds the other one's doing it? Fire, 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 fire the spouse who's left behind. So they ended up on welfare, I think it was twice, in, in the first four or five years. And then she, wow. you know, somebody took a, took a chance on her, and, and she got a new job, and, and, and he's out of prison, got out, I think, two years ago. And fortunately, they're, they're still together. They're still together. And as you know, many white collar criminals, their spouses divorce them. So I think they just is like 85% or something like that are divorced by their spouse. Gary, let me ask you a question. We're, we're in the last segment, and, and I know that you were uh, just featured in a Wall Street Journal Market Watch article, which kudos to you for being able to pull that off. Uh, I, I, I know you've worked many, many years at creating a fabulous business, but to to be featured in the Wall Street Journal is uh, that that's that's up there. Um, I, I, but I have to ask you this question, and since I'm one of them, and I'm not sure what your answer is going to be, this is a bit risky, but let's go there. There are some people, especially when you look at the comments, that says once a con, always a con. People can, can't be changed. You've had the opportunity to experience a lot of people who have made serious mistakes in life and have been convicted. What's your experience of uh, trusting or believing that you can actually find some level of redemption or change in life? Well, you know, I get that question all the time. You know, how do you trust them? And the answer is, I don't have to. I've got all the money. Well, that's true. <laughs> so remember, typically it's pretty easy to tell, for example, after the article was in the Wall Street a couple of days ago, 
Um, I've gotten, as you can imagine, just a ton of requests. Uh, can I be a speaker? And it's pretty easy, frankly, to pick the ones out or figure out the ones who want to do presentations. And the reason is they want a platform to say it wasn't their fault. You know, right. the, the FBI prep, you know, I did it for my staff. And, and so I tell everybody that writes me, um, there are, because everybody says, what are the requirements to be a speaker? And the answer is I have two, two really simple requirements. One is you have to out of prison. That always helps. Right. The second one is you have to take responsibility for what you did, and you have to admit it. You have to be willing to answer any question that somebody puts to you, whether it's me or the press or the Wall Street Journal, or you also were profiled in Forbes a couple of weeks ago, as you know. Um, That's right. And so you have to be willing to do, do, admit what you did, take responsibility, and answer any questions. And I tell them right up front, the only, and I tell reporters this, who call me up and say, yeah, I want to interview some of your papers. Okay, you can ask them any question that you want. The only thing that is off limits is their personal sex life. Unless that has something to do with crime, like you stole money to have an affair. Then it's fair game because right. it's part of the crime. Right. And, or, for example, um, if it's been a recent crime, there have been several speakers who are getting death threats, and so their families have gone off to live someplace else. Okay, you, you can ask, but they're not going to tell you where their family is. You can right. say, what's been the impact on your family, but they're not going to tell you where they're at. So there are a handful of things that are, that are, that are off limits, but not many, not many. And it's, frankly, it's pretty easy to tell uh, just by the way the emails or the conversations go, who's, going to, who's ready to admit what they did and who isn't ready. Who isn't ready? So you know, I've been doing this since 1987, so you just kind of developed a, a sixth sense about that. Gary, there was a, a guy out in California. Well, you know what? Maybe that's going to be on another show. Okay. This is, uh, this is Chuck Gallagher. This is Straight Talk Radio. And my guest has been Gary Zaini with the pros and the cons. Uh, go to his website and check out the, the, the cadre of people that he has. There's a lot of people that work with Gary who are professionals, who absolutely uh, can, can help your organization understand what you need to do to create a culture of ethical behavior and prevent fraud. Gary is a master of that, and it's been my honor to have him here on Straight Talk Radio. It has been Straight Talk. Hopefully, it has been transformational to you because we are on Transformation Talk Radio. This is Chuck Gallagher. Stick with us. We would love to have you back next week where we'll have other exciting guests on Straight Talk Radio. And remember, every choice has a consequence. You've been listening to Straight Talk with Chuck Gallagher. Tune in each week on TransformationTalkRadio.com each Monday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern as Chuck Gallagher, international speaker and author, cuts through the noise to share truth through transparency. Nationally known guests talk about what's important to you, your life, your concerns, and your success. Visit ChuckGallagher.com for more information and turn on to Straight Talk with Chuck Gallagher.